conversation. Our speaker today will be John Dow, and he will be in conversation with Trina Clements, and he will be talking about the ways in which his experience has, as a young man in a small rural Sudanese town, has shaped a rather dramatic story of what has happened in his life since that time. Just a, a brief word about Sudanese in the United States. There was not before about 1990, very many Sudanese in the United States at all. The number is still uh, rather small, uh, a little bit somewhere between um, 55 and 60,000 uh, Sudanese living in the United States. And uh, some of us may not be aware that the third, the state with the third largest Sudanese population is Virginia, with a population of about 38,000, uh, 3,800 uh, Sudanese uh, living in Virginia. Uh, in Middlesex County, some people will remember that Price Church School had a uh, distinguished student and athlete uh, at one point whose name was Peter Deng Bull, who graduated in the 90s and has remained in contact. Um, with the school and its alumni office since that time. Our speaker today, our primary speaker today is John Dow, who is a scholar in residence at the Collegiate School in Richmond and is the head of the John Dow Foundation. And uh, following this talk, we will post again links, updated links, uh, for those who would like to learn more about John and his work. He is going to be interviewed today by his colleague, Trina Clements, who is also at the Collegiate School in Richmond. And she is the Director of Economic Literacy and Entrepreneurship, and also the Director of a Summer Institute, which has kept her busy uh, recently, I imagine, uh, working in those areas. Uh, and so uh, Trina is going to ask questions to John. After about 40 minutes, I'm going to come back on the line uh, and I am going to uh, first read any questions which have been submitted by chat. Um, and then uh, I will invite uh, those to open up their mic uh, and ask other questions that haven't been asked to that point. Uh, so uh, I would appreciate if uh, you would mute uh, until that moment uh, so that we don't have a lot of background noise and we have better uh, uh, projection of our, uh, our Zoom presentation. I have one question, uh, Trina, and then I'll disappear uh, or I'll mute myself and get out of the picture. Um, and I'm interested uh, in the term lost boys. I think I understand uh, what a lost boy is and what history that implies. Uh, it's certainly basic to John's story. Uh, I was wondering if you and John uh, could uh, say a little bit about that lost boy story uh, for maybe some uh, who are less acquainted with that story. John, I think you are the expert on that, having that lived experience. So I'll toss that one to you and then um, we'll go from there. Well, uh, thank you, Bob, and thank you, uh, 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 Trina, and of course, everyone that is watching. Uh, it's my pleasure uh, to be invited today to talk about uh, uh, my life story. And of course, there's the same questions uh, that who is the lost boy? Why is it called lost boy? And of course, other thing that, uh, that helped me grow up to be uh, who I am. The lost boy, the term lost boys was actually coined by uh, by, um, by, by, by United Nations agencies workers, uh, those who, who interacted with us, I think from 1987, uh, you know, when we were in Ethiopia and later we were in uh, Kenya. So they came up with the ter term lost boys and of course lost girls as well, uh, because we were there with our parents and we were very young and about, uh, what, you know, about uh, 13,000 so pass with no parent. So I think I, I agree with them, those who said, the these are lost boys and lost girls because, 
you know, there's no, no child could be there or that number without parent. So I think that is how the name, uh, you know, uh, came to, uh, we came to be known as Lost Boys and of course Lost Girls as well. Okay. Well, John, um, thank you for explaining that. And um, John and I have known each other for six years now, almost to the day. Um, we started at Collegiate on the same day. And we pretty quickly bonded because we both grew up in rural communities. I grew up in the town of West Point, spending a lot of summers and time in Middlesex County um, and then on farms in King William and King and Queen County. Um, so when John and I came to know each other, we shared hunting stories, stories about animals, um, just all the things we learned to do in ways and mindsets from being children of the countryside. So um, John, I mean, may maybe to start out, could, um, could you share a little bit about what your childhood was like in your rural village um, and maybe some of the things you learned as a child that came to be valuable as your life story unfolded? Sure. Well, uh, as you know, there's something that made me so excited to talk about than to talk about the, uh, you know, village life. Uh, village life. Um, you know, I, I, I was born in a very remote area. Where there's no hospitals, no clinics, no school, no cars, no road, nothing. There is no any piece of civilization we could see. The only thing that we could see was some plane moving, we call American uh, at night, because those are the, you know, there's, you know, when people want to travel at night, or travel but early in the morning or at night, they said, we're going to travel when the first American uh, came. So there's these, now I became, began to know that these are these Tuan, uh, you know, trans, cons, you know, uh, you know, you know, th those who plan who go to Africa and, and go around the world, you know, or somebody would say, no, let not leave. We will leave the second American when it, it coming over the village, you know, it, it, it make noise, you know, they better high, and then people set their uh, journeys schedules on those things. Those were the only things outside uh, things that. Uh, we were interact with, but we were not, not being part of it, but that's what we used to see. Now, being, uh, being said that, I, um, you know, we love our village. I mean, there is nothing, really, nothing so good than to live in the village. As you live in the village as a young boy or a young girl, you know, you have job. As I said before, there were no school, but the job that we do sort of uh, became our school. For example, if you are a boy, then you start uh, taking care of, as a, I mean, maybe about when you are five years old, you start given an opportunity or a job to do, which means take care of chicken. So you have to make sure that these chicken are not eaten by foxes or wild cats, things like that, bobcat and so on. Uh, and so that's your work as a boy. You make sure when the when the chickens are making noise somewhere, you know, remember this is a, a pre-rain. When they're making noise somewhere that something is eating them or hawk or something like that. So it's my job, making sure every morning at five years old, six years old, seven years old, you make, make sure your chicken uh, are safe, you know, that well taken care of and so on and so on. So that's uh, your job. But if you maybe about when you are about seven, to nine years old, then you transition from taking care of chicken to taking care of goats. Your, your uncles, your, uh, your fathers, and they will give you some weapon. Weapon is like, a, like a spears, you know, a stick. This uh, thing they're given to you to go to the forest with your, with your goat and sheep. And then in the neighborhood, you know, some uh, boy from the neighborhood bring the cow, uh, the, go together, then you go into the jungle, making sure hyenas don't eat them because the favorite food for hyenas are goats, you know, and sheep as well. So make sure leopard or, uh, you know, uh, hyenas don't eat them. You fight them, you, you know, uh, protect your animal. And then you, you be there for about five hours away with no, with no adults, it's just you. While you are outside there, you know, you, you know each other. You, this is where you, you know, hierarchies are set. And of course, who is the leader there? 
where generations of these people see who could could be their leaders uh, based on what we do. Um, and then after that too, you, you actually transition from taking care of, sheep, uh, of goats and sheep to taking care of cows at a 10, 11, 12. So you go up again, now become a little bit grown, make sure, uh, you know, lion, this is where we now learn to fight those animals. You know, li lion could come or other wild animals such as hyenas too, could come there and grab them. So you have to fight them. You don't run to the adults. You have to uh, make sure your animals are protected. While out there, you know, you sit on the top of uh, an hill, you know, it's a little bit high. And then because, because the long grass, the savanna grass better long, so it's young, you cannot see your cows well. Either you climb up on trees and then stay there on trees, all of you, or sit on some an hill. And then you take a turn and say, now's your turn to go and take care of, bring the cows back, or make sure you go and look at the cow, you know, make check on them like that. And then you keep playing, you play. And while you're doing those, while you're taking care of goats and sheep and cows, you, um, you tell stories. <laughs> These stories are very important. So you take turn. Uh, this is the way you learn stories. So when you go home later, you learn from each other. When you go home later, you can share some stories with your uh, brothers and sisters. Uh, when you go to bed, people share stories. And sharing stories is not just only sharing stories. It's sharing a story and tell the moral value of these stories about the community, about how to be a brave person, about, about uh, how bad it is to be lazy. You know, laziness is not good. Uh, wrapping people's stuff is not good. Telling lies is, is terrible, all these kind of things. So you learn a basic community values there. Basically, you, you, you learn by yourself. These are the things you do. But if you are also a girl, you still have your job. A five girl, young girl, take care of, you know, uh, things like mom would send them to get a fire, right? Why fire? If you live in the United States, you say, what, what? Because we have, uh, you know, fire available here. I mean, it's all, all you 24 seven, you turn off something called uh, uh, stove and then, and then voila, there's fire. You cook with it. And then when you don't want it, turn it off in the United States. Okay. Or, you know, but in South Sudan, no. So you have to make sure there is a, a place for fire. You know, fire is well kept. Sometime, you know, fire, you've gone out from your home. So as a girl, you will be sent to a neighbor to go and collect a fire, to bring fire there on a wood, on a little wood there and bring it here. So that's what you do. So that's what you do. You are sent to do things. You are also, when you grow, you sort of uh, uh, grown a little bit, you start taking care, you start going to find water, you know, fresh water. You go to a distance with mom. You go to a distance with other older girls uh, to collect water. You put it in your head in a big jar of can, water there, and bring it. You go back and forth every day. That's what you do, taking care of your siblings as well young girls, you know, it's your job to care for one another. And this is where you create a bond with your sibling, with your brothers and sisters, with your cousins. So if, uh, let's say, a newly wed person do not, you know, just only a wife and a husband, you know, you know, your child, if you have more children, they will be taken to stay with auntie, stay with uncle, like that. And that's what, what, what you do. All of this that you do, Trina, uh, with a boy or a girl, all what you do here is what I call our school. You know, it's the same thing. In the United States, we have something called classroom, where uh, somebody called teacher will be standing in front of a bunch of kids and teach them, uh, you know, read from books, you know, practical too, and so on. That is the same thing we achieve. You know, you learn from each other. You learn from doing it. You learn from one another, you know, it does not matter whether you have a, an adult or not. So you learn from each other, you kind of, uh, 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 you know, cheering uh, ways of doing things. And that is, that is, is something can never be replaced. Whether you are in a classroom here, modern classroom in the United States, in, 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 in Middlesex or somewhere else here in Virginia or around the world. No. So John, how, 
how might have that childhood experience then prepared you? Um, because at the age of 12, um, had you even gotten to the point where you're taking cows, taking care of cows when you were 12? Yes, so I am in yes. the middle of that and I would have to transition when I got to about 15. Then I, okay. I, I could be initiated, my head could be cut in some muck, so I could be initiated into adulthood. So before you were initiated into adulthood in your village, you the war broke out. And um, could you maybe share what that transition was like, all those lessons you learned, all the stories that you were told, um, how, was it 1987, John? Yes. How in 1987, in the middle of the night, your entire childhood was disrupted and you had to be extremely resourceful just to stay alive. Um, share some of, of that experience between um, leaving your village and coming to Virginia. What were those years like? Absolutely, uh, you know, and um, as I, you know, explained it, very exciting <laughs> talking about it, uh, that life, that wonderful life we call a village or a, a community or a country that, that was filled with milk and honey, uh, that was disrupted very quickly. It was disrupted, that life was disrupted uh, by the, you know, the, 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 you know, this civil war, second civil war, Sudan's second civil war that started in 1983. Uh, and that was, the war was fought between the Muslim North and then the Christian animist South, where I came from. So war started uh, as a, um, it, 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 it's, it's a, you know, the government of Sudan, the, the president at the time declare country uh, constitution to include Sharia law, right? So everyone, whether you are Christians or you are animist or whatever it is, you have to observe all those Muslims uh, principle and, 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 and way of living and so on. But it didn't sit well. So there were so many others as well. I mean, factors reach, you know, got to, uh, you know, to the war. Uh, but that one was big thing. That was Tigaret. But there were so many things. South Sudan was mistreated. They were not, they were treated as second class citizen in their own country. You cannot be a, a you know a, 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 an African to be a leader. You know these Arab have to be the leader and so on. There, so there are so many things that that were triggered by that announcement that the country constitution will have a Sharia law in it. So, but 1983, that's when the war started. Didn't get to my village. We were still practicing what I was just explaining. You know, our life was good, very good. Until 1987, when I was 12 years old, this is when my village was attacked in the middle of night. My brothers and I, we were sleeping our own little hut there. And it was my mother uh, was calling outside saying, children, children, get out. We're saying, meet, meet, Bakabe. As we got out, uh, Trina, I saw somebody running across my home compound. I thought it was my father. The guy that I thought was my father later, and I was running after him. We ran. He got a dutch into the grass, went into the grass. And when I was coming, he grabbed my arm, uh, pulled me into the grass. A long line of troops were coming, shooting, killing anybody they could see, looting our cows, bur burning down our villages, and so on. It was a disaster. And that's why I said it was as if God got tired of us. Why did God allow these people to be mowing down us like that for nothing? We didn't do anything at all, but they did that. So that is when my village was attacked. The guy that I thought was my father turned out to be a, a neighbor. So that night in the following morning, around about five in the morning, we kept running away from where we were hiding from. Then we kept going two days later, with no food, you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, later this guy, you know, we were, we, I was so weak as well, going for two days with no food and, and being running like that. And it was difficult. Uh, so I, I was very extremely weak. Um, I need something to eat. I need my mother. I need everyone. Uh, so this guy kept dragging me. So we kept going. Later, he dug a, a, a plan, a, a plan called Amojro. Amojro, it's a plan, but it has under beneath it in the root there, it's a big uh, 
ball, like look like a tomato, uh, you know, potato. Uh, so he dug it out, we ate it. Uh, that was our first food after, uh, you know, um, uh, for three days there. So we kept going. Now I knew we're not gonna go back. This is going to be tough. I, you know, keep constantly thinking about my family members. Along the way, uh, it was pretty cold. Um, no blanket that you cover yourself. So Abraham and I, we kept going. Uh, we went, uh, you know, later we met uh, a woman and her two daughters. So five of us who kept going. Along the way, we just, uh, sometime we walk at night so that we can avoid being detected by the hostile community that we might be going through uh, their communities. We go into the jungle and stay there daytime under trees until it is night. When it is night, we resume our walking. Finding food was difficult. We could go to homes, those the home that were abandoned, we can find some pumpkins or some uh, dry, dry um, uh, you know, uh, beans or just chewing stock, you know, like a maize stock, a sorghum stock. It was, you know, or we can cut some grass offers, roast them like a marshmallow. That's what you do, the children do it here, uh, you know, eat them. We, we do not eat uh, grass offers, but you know, when you are near death, you, you, you can eat anything, you know, that uh, come across your way. Now, finding water was also difficult. We, we came up with some strategies of finding, listening to the sound of frog making noise at night. We knew that there's, there's, there's water there. This is a good strategy, we could find water. Um, or we could see birds circling around. Uh, either something is dead there or there's water there. So these, those were things that we were, were using. Now, by this time, we were about two months on our, on our journey from home now we were going to where Ethiopia. Uh, we started three, uh, two, later we're five. And then in the middle, there were about 19 of us. So some along the way died because of starvation or because of thirst or being attacked by well, wild animal as well. Uh, those who could not walk that, you know, any, any longer, they just, you know, just uh, decided to uh, die there. You can't go, can't move, you just want to stay there. So there's no way you can help one another. We were kids, um, there were few adults there trying their best, we could not do anything. By the time we were almost in our 33rd month walking through a tribe called Murile. Murile was hostile. They, they, they collaborated with the Arab in the north. And so anybody that is from our tr tribe or something like that, they will kill them. So what we did was to, to go around their home, making our journey better long, and they're taking us away from water as well. So we came to a place called Kong Kong, there was no water. Uh, we, so the number of us now, we became 27 of us. There was no water, uh, people were crying, people wanna, you know, um, uh, you urinate so that uh, urine, you can have somebody drink urine, those who cannot really, cannot wake, got up or something like you give them urine to drink. That didn't help as well. We went almost for two days with no water. Sun was so hot. It was as if it is just so close to our skin. It was desperation set in, uh, people crying, uh, all 27 of us. Now you are on your own. Either you want to stay there under a tree or you know tie some uh, you know grass together, make it like a little roof there and stay there and some kept going. I was going as well. I said, it's better to die moving. I'm not gonna die here. I'm not gonna sit, wait for my death. I'm gonna move forward. So we kept going, we kept going. Later we found uh, muddy, muddy water. We were better lucky found. So we started scooping it, uh, eating this mud helped a little bit because that water seeped into our bodies. Um, and then, and then later we kept going and kept going and then we can find water and best water, good water and good water, of course. Um, only four of us survived. We're 27, uh, 23 uh, left, they all died. Then we, now we, we, we wait there, there was nobody coming. We're trying to go back and find people who could not find anybody. We even get, get, got lost. And um, so we said, okay, if they are, if anybody alive, they may come up to us. So we kept going. 
Now, by this time, we were in the so two, uh, two and a half months now on our journey. Uh, at night, so we sleep together next to each other because there's no blanket to cover ourselves. So you, you know, giving each other warm like that. And uh, so we came to another community called Anyuak. We found that they have killed an elephant that day. Uh, we went there to bake, bake them for food, give a, you know, to give us an elephant meat. Uh, so as we were coming there, they were cutting the, the meat into pieces and so on. So we came there and baked for them if they could help us. One young boy, I think young man, ran up, you know, chased us away. And then we ran away. We went there and stand, stand uh, at a distance. Uh, I think an older man, you know, I guess, felt fit on us. And then he came to us and said, come, come. You know, keep, we didn't, could not talk in the same language, but it just keep coming, come, come. So as we say, well, what do, you know, maybe they are loading out there to kill us or something. Other will say, well, I mean, there's nothing there. We're going to die anyway. So we went back to them. They gave us a big chunk of elephant meat. And they say, go. So we went there. We went to find a, uh, a little pot, cook it, cook it for hours. Uh, we were so happy they were cooking our food. So later, when it cooked, you know, there was no, no uh, knife to cut it into pieces. So I, I got it and tear it with my teeth, give it to that person, tear another piece, give it to the other person, like that, until we all got enough of elephant meat. We drank. Uh, uh, soup uh, of it, and it was just great. That was our best food after, since we left home. So we kept some some of the elephant meat. We kept going. Now we were going to were to now to cross Ethiopian boat, cross into Ethiopia. Uh, it was uh, were there a few days later. We cross into into Ethiopia. Now the government of Ethiopia said, "Okay, you know, see that jungle." You go and stay there, make it as your home. So we went there, live under trees for a while, and then we tried, tried to uh, build our own homes uh, there. Uh, and then a number of the boys and girls were coming and they would converge into this area. Now num our number uh, was getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So because we lost families, we create our own families, a family of 50 people, 50 people as a family. As I said before, I was, I was 12 years old, but I was taller than the other boys. So I was picked to become a leader of one group. So I was in charge of one group, uh, which means 50 people. They later put more into my group. We became about 1,200 boys. Their age were from age five to age 15. These boys are crying every day. They want to drink milk. They want to see their mothers. They want to uh, eat food. You know, there's nothing I and other older boys could do. We lie to them, you know, tomorrow will be good. Uh, you know, we're sort of giving them hope. Tomorrow will be good. Today is bad. Tomorrow will be good. So giving our brothers some sort of hope uh, to hope for tomorrow. Um, later, the United Nations start coming, the World Food Program, the World Vision. And they start coming there and uh, distribute. They brought some food, uh, like food with um, dry corn. Uh, that was really good. They would can cook it, cook it like that. And then they start bringing some secondhand clothes, you know. Uh, remember there, you know, you guys have children, you know, I mean, the children here in the United States, I would grow clothes very quickly. And, uh, and then you take them to uh, maybe Goodwill or something like that. And those clothes sometimes get to the refugee camp. I remember when I was my first, given my first shirt, uh, my first clothes, that was a white shirt. I think I belonged to a girl because they have some elastic, they have some decoration around it. Uh, that was really good. So when you are given a shirt, Somebody else is given a button, which means given a short or a uh, trouser, um, pants or something like that. It was great. And then they start building some, uh, you know, uh, you know, distributing some uh, blanket. It was great. Quill. There's uh, these uh, blanket here in the U.S. called quill. I actually, when I came here, I was looking for it. I found it with uh, well, with uh, uh, you know, LDS. You know, they put all these things together and, uh, you know, like layers. It was just great. So we, now the, our life was getting better there in that camp. I think that's when we start to be called Lost Boy there. And they, they call it a city of children. Uh, I see that uh, there was a, uh, a clip from uh, CNN or some somebody, you know, or BBC, so a children, I mean, a city of children. So we're there in the city of children. We're there um, four years there. 
uh, but a problem happened again. We were then pushed out of, of, of Ethiopia because of Ethiopian rebel uh, captured the country, which is the current government of Ethiopia right now. So they asked us to go back to South Sudan. And as we're moving back to South Sudan, you know, we have to cross some rivers. Number of the lost boys, lost girls, and some adults, we became 27,000 of us. As we're crossing rivers, we have to cross rivers back into South Sudan. We crossed a river called Gila, where, uh, you know, where we were uh, driven to it by the by the Ethiopian government or the Ethiopian rebel, or call them troop. Uh, they drop us into the shot on us. Uh, they drop us through these uh, um, uh, these waters infested with a lot of crocodiles. It's like when you watch National Geographic Channel, you see animal crossing rivers in Africa. That's what we were going through. You know, some of the boys and girls were uh, eaten by crocodiles, others drowned, others lost, some uh, captured, uh, you know, myself and others, we were lucky, those were lucky. And now when I, you know, we got to the other side, which means we're now back into Sudan, into South Sudan, not to our villages, but in a place called, uh, you, know, um, you, you, you know, this place called Pochala. Stay there in Pochala, uh, there was no food, uh, coming from anywhere, then we start selling our clothes for food until, until we all remain naked, no, no clothes. We sold all blanket, shirt, we're being bombed every day by, by uh, government of Sudan using Russian made anc 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 you know, aircraft known as, known as Antonov, killing some of the boys and girls. So we decided to move to the interior part of South Sudan. Took us about six months to get there to the border of uh, Sudan and Ethiopia and, and Kenya. That was then 1992 now. Uh, now we were then attacked from these places. So eventually we crossed into another country called Kenya, 1992. At that time I was 17 years old. Um, so this, so coming to Kenya was great. This is when we established a refugee camp known as Kakuma refugee camp, which is the largest refugee camp today. We stay there in, in, in the refugee camp. And this is when I start to learn A, B, C, D, one, two, three, at age 17. I've never been to any school of any kind before. We were sitting under trees, using our fingers as pencil to write exam, to write all the things that teachers ask us to do. It was, it was beautiful. We were getting education until I finished my high school in the year 2000. Now we were told that Amer we were going to America, you know, that America, have accepted us to go to United States. They're going to take the lost boys. And now, uh, so in the camp, all these Americans came, you know, the, my first time, to, I guess, to see white people. Uh, they, um, you know, this guy long, with, with the long noses and, um, and um, you know, so what they were talking about is that they would take us to United States. And, um, well, we didn't believe them. And then they started doing paperwork. And then some of us taken to Nairobi. Nairobi is the capital city of Kenya. And then some were taken to United States, like my, my you know, later to be my wife was a, one of the lost girls as well, came to Washington state. And now people start talking about America. Even some are saying, you know, it's okay to be lazy in America because if you are lazy in America, people, people will tie something called green cut around your neck. And, uh, and uh, you go to any restaurant, show up at any restaurant in America wearing green card, the owner of the restaurant will say, oh, welcome, you are, an, uh, you are a, you know, a you know, refugee, you, you know, you came from refugee camp, you are a refugee, come and eat for free. I was, I was excited that, uh, you know, there is a place where you can eat for free, you know? While others were saying, you know, John, be careful America, in America because American girls are crazy. Said how crazy that they said all the girls in the United States they carry small bag, and he said, "Do you know what is in those bag?" I said, "No." He said, "They have guns in it. Mm -hmm. If you mess up with American girls, they shoot and kill you." Uh, <laughs> I said, "You know what am I gonna do? I mean, women are killing people in America." Anyway, my name came out of the board. Said, "John, you're going to Syracuse, New York." I was so excited. I uh, said, "You know, you know, there's nothing. I'm leaving here. I mean, it's good to uh, go there." came to United States and, um, you know, as, as we flew to Europe and then to JFK and then to Syracuse, New York, there were people from our church waiting for us, about 14 of them. 
And when we got out, they hug us, they greet us, we greet them as well. They were very nice people, but there were four girls there. I didn't want to go and hug those girls. I thought they would be mad and shoot and kill me. So I stayed away <laughs> from them. And then later, they, um, they took us to a, uh, you know, to uh, our apartment, which actually took them uh, entire uh, day to show us how to turn off light. This is how you twist light, how you push light, twist mm -hmm. and so on. This is hot water, this is cold water. It was just, it took them entire day. But before they go, go back home, Susan, you know, Susan Myers and, and Penny Allen, they said, John, let us take you to buy groceries, show you how to buy groceries. So the, this big giant grocery store there uh, called Peter's at that time. So we went there, it was just closer to our apartment. We went there and we we're coming closer and closer a magic door opened itself like this, you know? I said, well, <laughs> truly the American people are very lazy and that's why they don't want to pull and push the door. Uh, <laughs> I didn't want to well, tell them, I thought these women will be mad and shoot and kill me. So <laughs> <laughs> you're, in a, you're in a stickle. Well, John, you know, the types of things you explain, you're, you, you now have five children, right? Ages 15 to six, am I right? Five, yep, five. F 15 to five. And so the latter part of your story is now normal to them, right? That is their their life. Um, so I'm wondering, because um, you were sustained so much by your village and the stories of your village and your experience as a young person, how do you, um, maybe even through your job at Collegiate and then also with your own children, what is the work that you strive to do um, and what is what how do you share with your children the culture that you came from when um just this summer your first only two of your children went to Africa for the very first time um share a little bit we have about five more minutes like share a little bit about um what you teach why you teach it and how your children are learning um, a lot of the lessons of your childhood well thank you uh, Trina one of the one of the best thing that I would do is to find a way to send them to Africa. One, uh, the two went, now three left. Uh, so that would be the best way to emerge into it. This is the best way to learn. This is the best way to, to, to be a come acquainted to daddy and mommy uh, culture, which we, what we want now to do. Now, before we can do that, before we can take them there, merge them into the culture and so on, what we do right now, um, we, we, we teach them how to become a South Sudanese as well as an American. How do you do it? How do we do it is that, for example, Trina, if you come, the next time you come to our house, you know, we let, let our children call you auntie, you know, be, be, you know, you know, call, we are, you know, we, we, we are almost, you know, the same age or same age of my wife as well. So they have to call you auntie. If, if, um, you know, you know, if David come here as well, your husband, they will call Uncle David. It has to be like that. Whether there is a relationship or not, uh, you know, broad relationship or not, it, it is it, uh, South Sudanese, you call an elder person as, you know, not their name, but uncle, auntie, grandma, grandfather, very important. So when, when somebody come here, we, so they're using their devices, I guess some, at some point, they have to leave their devices and come and say hi to that person. And then you just don't say hi, you check hand, check hand, and then find a way and this, my name is so-and-so. You know, that is what you, that's what we are now teaching them to do. My name is so-and-so. And then visit a little bit before you go back to, you disappear to your, uh, something that they were doing. That's what is, so when somebody is leaving, we would say, uh, you, everyone have to come back and escorted that person out and say and say bye-bye when the person got into the car. And that is a culture, as our culture that way, you know, we have to, you know, you, you know, to teach them. And things like the respect, you know, uh, community values. You know, in the United States, they said children eat, play, and what? Do what? And, and sleep. Well, in South Sudan, children eat, play, sleep, work. They have to work as well. So they have to do that is in the United States coach. I, I, I don't know, you guys call child abuse or whatever it is, I don't know. But I don't want to know that. But it is important that they have to do because 
at some point, I'm not going to be in their life. They have to be, you know, have to stand on their own feet, uh, uh, you know, trainer. So that is important. Uh, people say, you know, you have to straighten them out. You get to have to know the community values. They have to know the, uh, the, the, the local neighborhood values as well. It is important, uh, you know, to, to do that. And that's what we do. That's it, the little thing that we can do while they're here in the United States. But I hope if we can do that, we can have them come to South Sudan to merge into the culture. They went there, I've got an uh, they like it, you know, so that's very important. Well, and I think we even have a video <laughs> clip of Anir who is six, oh, eight, Anir's eight. eight. Um, so John took, uh, well, Martha, John's wife, took two of their children along with some family members back to South Sudan. Uh, back, did they go to South Sudan, John, or just Kenya? South Sudan and Kenya. In South Sudan and Kenya. And John, um, well, this is quite an amazing piece of news. Your family all made it through the war. They all lived, your, all your siblings and your mother and father. So you have a lot of family still in South Sudan involved in the government and service of um, the people trying to help rebuild that company. I mean, the country. But um, I don't know if, if someone ha is driving the bus um, could play the video of Inyer dancing um, with friends of John's while she was in um, Kenya last couple of weeks ago. And so wonderful that they were able to be there with family and friends. And they also visited with your uncle, who's uh, serving in the government, your, your region of South Sudan. He represents a large portion of the country and John Stinka people in the South Sudanese government. Um, so, John, thank you for sharing your story. It's um, it's a touching one, and it's um, I had to take care of chickens too when I was four and five. So we we share that. I had to weigh the eggs and sort them so my grandfather could sell them. John and I had a lot in common when we first met. But um, I think uh, we would turn that over to to questions now. Um, Bob, what's the plan? That that's the plan. We've got uh, fifteen or twenty minutes in which we can. Uh have some questions and one of them has been posted. Uh, Besida has posted a question in um, chat. And John, it is this, have you connected with other Sudanese families in Central Virginia and other parts of the US? Also, have you explored connections between your culture and other African cultures and African American cultures? Mm -hmm. so a big set of questions. <laughs> Thank you, Basada. Yes, yeah, so uh, Basada, um, yes, we we are connected uh, with uh, the folks here in, in in Virginia, Northern Virginia, and also here in Central Virginia, and and of course in some time somewhere there in Roanoke. There, we have South Sudanese uh, all all uh, across the, uh, the the state, um, and we have I think here in Virginia. I mean, in Richmond, around Richmond area, we have about uh, three churches, three South Sudanese churches uh, that uh, they, you know, used to worship. I'm not because COVID, COVID then turned everything upside down as well. It, it did to all the communities, including South Sudanese communities. So I, right now, I don't think they are meeting anymore. Uh, they go to other individual churches, uh, American churches and so on. Uh, but yes, but they also in the Northern Virginia to DC area, Maryland, uh, we, we, we do have, uh, uh, we, we are in touch. So we are in touch with people. I moved here, uh, uh, Richmond about six um, years ago, uh, but sort of a little bit, uh, not knowing everyone, not knowing all South Sudanese here, but I know some here, even 
one of my cousin is here too, is in, uh, uh, you know, in a, I think it's in uh, uh, Mechanicsville. Yeah, that's where he lived now. So yeah, um, exploring our cultures with other communities in the United States, including African-American communities. We do. Um, when I was in New York, uh, we used to go to African-American communities uh, event. Um, and, and also we invited them as well, all the community, whether the white community, the African American communities, Latinos as well, uh, or other part of Africa, like such as Ghana and Nigeria and Kenya and so on. We pretty much in Africa, we pretty much have almost the same cultures, uh, same, same, same practice and so on. But with African American communities uh, here in the US, uh, you know, yeah, we 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 uh, we 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 a little bit uh, do have common uh, common cultures. Now, what I've been asking my brothers from uh, brothers and sisters from African American communities is that, for example, uh, who who name your children? Who is actually have that uh, opportunity to or duty to do that? Uh, it seemed like uh, you know in the U.S. they find a book uh, or maybe elders, I think, maybe. But in South Sudan, it's strictly uh, the grand, gra grandma and grandfather work. Like all of my children were named by, by, my, grand, uh, my, 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 by my father and my mother. Uh, because if my great-grandparent or grandparent is still alive, it would be their job. Now, because they are no longer alive, it's my father and my mother's job. Now my father died 29, 2017. Now it's my mom's job. So my mom will be the one, and actually the one now naming all the children around my community. I, uh, I mean, my uh, family. So she's the older. Uh, my uncle are there, but my uncle, my mother is older than them. So she is the one who is in charge of naming children because naming children is so important uh, that no, no, uh, a young person is allowed to name children, you know? So it's one thing that I don't know in the African-American community, is that what it is? Or, uh, or somebody just uh, named children? I'm just picking one, one practice that uh, we, may, we, we may work together or correlate or may not as well. Uh, things like that. Uncles in the United States, uh, you know, in South Sudanese community, uncle are the one at the neck group, uncle and aunties are the neck group that can give you uh, uncle, grand, you know, and aunties as well. And then mom and dad are the one who allowed you to marry. In the United States, I think when you think you are ready to marry, you marry, right? In South Sudan, it's not that way. It's not when you think you, you are ready to marry. You, it, it's your mom, it's your elders who can allow you now to get married. And getting married is not just the woman you love, only, it's not about that. It has to go through a tedious uh, background check. For example, if I want to get married, like I get married to my wife here, I, I you know, I am allowed to say, okay, your time to, to get married. Then my, um, you, 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 you know, uh, and the others will just say, okay, how many she, girls you are seeing? Because in South Sudanese, you're seeing more. You, you don't date a girl. You don't go out with a girl. You're just seeing them. And then they will say, which one do you love? Uh, and you will say, it's Mary. Okay, they will go find Mary parent, find Mary grand grandparent. Have they killed somebody there before? Have, were, were they lazy? Were they this and that and that? Same thing to me. The family of Mary will say, this John lazy guy. This John like to fight people. It's John who, 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 what, what did he do? You know, things like that. I have to, so a background check, it's a, it's a matter of <laughs> the community have to be part of that. You just don't get married. And, and the divorce, it's very difficult to occur because through their rigorous uh, background check and so on. So it is there. I'm not sure whether it is in, in the African-American community or in the Caucasian community here or other community in the US. So it's something that we need to show to people, share with the people, but we, we better, we, we're not that very many to make any den in changing, you know, and helping people follow what we do, what we follow because it does not do anything. It is good, it's for the good of the community and so on. Uh, I maybe like to stop here, maybe another question. Thanks. 
but Basida um, has noticed that in her family, uh, her great grandparents named all their grandchildren. See, we uh, are the same. So maybe that is a survival of a custom she didn't recognize uh, as a um, an African custom. Uh, in, in, in my own family, we tend to, in my mother's family, um, we, we tend to give people names um, that keep alive the maiden names of women of earlier generations. So my sister's middle name is Montague, and that was my great grandmother's maiden name. And my middle name is Walton, which was my grandmother's uncle's uh, mother's name, uh, grandmother's name. You know, we keep we keep these uh, uh, keep names going. Um, you you had a question uh, from Jane Cutler. Um, Obviously, you and other lost children experienced such trauma uh, in the um, during the Civil War. Mm -hmm. um, have you had counseling to help each of you cope? What resources were you given to help you deal uh, with the experience of hunger and death that you faced and loss of family members? Mm -hmm. Well, it's, that is very good, Jane. Uh, very good question. And the reason why I like it's very good question is, of course, people who go through uh, a situation like what we went, uh, it, definitely they will have to have some sort of counseling and need help and so on. Uh, yes, there are some South Sudanese that uh, might have uh, gone through uh, this uh, therapy, I, I think. Uh, but but I'm not sure whether there's a lot uh, uh, people. Uh, I mean, I mean, what I would have to say is that yeah, there are some people who, if you watch the documentary that I am in, there was a boy that had a mental disturbance, and uh, it was sort of, I guess, Iraq, sort of Iraq behaviors, er er erratic behaviors in the in the bus, and so police have to take him out, and so on. So one of the lost boys. So that guy, you know, had a problem there. Uh, so we, when we found out he has a problem, so we took him to Africa. We collected money, gave him, you know, buy his ticket and gave some money. He is right now doing better well as a businessman in South Sudan. He when he when he was in when it is in South Sudan, it didn't even as you know ask or seek for uh, therapy. Uh, he's doing better well right now. So one of the things that we do right now, one is to uh, take some boys and girls to South Sudan. <laughs> you know, find a uh, you know a ticket for them, take them to South Sudan. They turn out to be doing better well there. Uh, they they you know doing normal work and so on. Uh, so that's what we do. But for me, for myself, I I do think and I've been advising or maybe I've been sharing with my audience that the best way of uh, when you have a, P, a, a P, 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 T, D, S, a P, P S T D, you know, so you. Um, what you have to do is to, uh, you know, get involved in your community, doing something. It's the best therapy. When you are involved in helping others, uh, it's the best uh, therapy that you can have. Because then why? Become, you become bigger than just yourself. You know, do something. You are in there to, you know, cause somebody to smile, bring smile faces to somebody. So the best way to do that, and this is what I do with, uh, what I share with some soldiers, or when I go to prison, is that the best thing you can do, you, you, can, you can go to psychiatrists and wherever you want to talk, it's up to you to do that. But the best way that I do that right now is to get involved in something, get something in your community, be part of big thing, make yourself as, a, see yourself as a bigger than just, just you, your little problem. All right, your little poem in quotation, you know, make it, make yourself to be bigger, you know, so that is, uh, you know, we mean to be uh, contributing to the life of others as well. And so that's how I do it right now. And, um, and that's how South Sunnis, I, that's how I, uh, you know, advise them, uh, get involved in something. Those things are not, don't think about what happened to you. Move on forward. When you become ideal, you think about what happened when you were a lost boy, lost girl, and so on, and then your mind will, will uh, you know, you know, become a problem. You will have a problem there. Uh, but when you are not thinking, you're busy. You're doing something for other people, and that's why you see that the work of the John Duff Foundation we are doing that, doing, doing better well because I recruited many people, get involved, and I don't even think about what happened. 
Yeah. And John has, um, his involvement has brought multiple clinics and incredible health care to all the people of South Sudan. So um, his, his, uh, he has channeled his trauma in ways that have touched the lives of thousands of people. That's, I, I have a question, which is a, a, a kind of immigrant story in the United States. And that is, sometimes immigrant groups come to the United States, and they um, uh, reproduce the uh, tribal and racial uh, tensions from the countries they came from. Um, sometimes they uh, have a uh, one of the experience of being an immigrant is people overcome those differences. Uh, so, um, if, if, so my question is this: um, the, the the Dinka people and the Noir people don't always have not always historically gotten along well in the Sudan. How are they doing among the people? Uh, among immigrants in the United States, are are your gatherings um, gatherings by tribe or by um, um, sub-Saharan Sudanese of all groups? We are we are gathering by let's say um, if all the people in Virginia they move to Canada for example, and there will be people from Chesterfield, the people from Middlesex the people from uh, Iraiko and so on and so on. These are the people that could have a meeting in Canada, they, whether they are from Nuer or the Dinka, but they are from one, one county, they now gathering in one place right now in the United States. So there's a sort of a county from home have a meet, sort of a reunion here, uh, you know, whenever they want it and they are doing things together. Yes, there is a problem between the Dinka and the Nuer these are two largest uh, tribe. Uh, my tribe, Dinka, uh, uh, it's 36% uh, of the population of South Sudan, while Nuer is about 18%. Uh, and these have loggerhead most of the time. They, they, they are similar. They're sort of like a brother and sister, really, compared to other, uh, for other 64 tribes in South Sudan. But they have been uh, fighting because of the leaders I had, you know, the, I mean, um, the, the, those who, who, who are leading them, uh, the president is Dinka, the vice president is Nuer right now. And these guys have been fighting over power. Somebody want to be, to be a, a, a leader or somebody want to stay on as a leader. So this is the problem. In 2010, I have collect, gathered some Nuer and the Dinka and the Murule and so on from United States, took them to South Sudan. We were been going from county to county, telling them peace is important, give peace a chance. Things like that, look, look at us. This is a Dinka, this guy next to me is a Nuer, the other guy is Murule and so on. See, we work together in the United States. We learn to work together in America. This is what we should do here in, the, in, in South Sudan. We did that in 20, 2010. Uh, there, John Duff Foundation did that. Oh, Bob, you're muted. Yes. Are, are there others who would like to unmute uh, and ask uh, John uh, questions directly? John, there's a question from Basida. Basida, I can tell you all five of his children go to collegiate and they're lovely and I get to see them every day. Um, and he can share more about that. But John, Basida asked a question I've never asked. Do, do, um, do your kids speak Dinka or any of, John speaks five, how many languages do you speak, John? I five. speak five. Five, yeah. And do they speak any other languages beyond English? No, really. I mean, it's difficult. We try, my wife Martha and I were trying to, get them to uh, learn the Dinka uh, language. It's, it's, it's pretty tough to, to do that. So what we did was said, okay, you know what? We're not gonna mess up with them because the language called English is the language they're going to compete. You know, So uh, Dinka, yeah, could be a secondary language there, but why don't we give them a chance not to go through what we, what we went through called English as second language. You know, so we don't want our kids. Uh, so they let them learn the first language called English. And then later we can help them learn uh, the Dinka language as well. 
And John Besida asked about um, any challenges that the kids might have going to collegiate because it is a it is a privileged school with with a lot of privilege. And John and I, we we were very aware of that. Um, and I mean, I can share there's a lot of affinity groups there, boys and brothers and sisters. Um, you know, John, you obviously know your children better. What what has their experience been at collegiate? Um, pretty you know, the experience has been very good. Um, so far, um, nothing, uh, you know, I, I guess nobody complained about being called of her or his skin or color. Uh, that never happened. Um, pretty much, pretty much. I think they've been very good. Uh, but they are little kids, you know, they're still young. Now, the big, as they grow, you know, you know, you may, may, maybe something will pop up, uh, especially with a god now who she is 15. And, um, you know, just some little issues uh, of, uh, you know, not discriminations, but, uh, you know, a teenager uh, want to bunch out, want to, uh, you know, you, 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 you know, I think I, it's just difficult to explain, but, uh, she been having those issues, uh, but but uh, are not issue that we think uh, that may be a you know a big problem. Of course, listen, we are South Sudanese. We were you know sort of <laughs> we grew up in different cultures, and so our kids are growing in completely different cultures as well. But as they become aware of their surrounding and so on, I think some other issues might, might come. But I think the school called Collegiate, I think it's, to be honest with you, I think it's very good. Uh, we're better lucky to uh, be given that opportunity to be there, uh, help our children to, to go there. So far, no problem at all. And John, maybe you could share with the side of what, and um, everyone on the Zoom, what did a got who's 15? She's uh, going into 10th grade. Um, what did a got share with you and Martha when she got back from Africa? Well, what she shared with me, uh, you know, uh, she she now uh, she said, okay, so what of discovering herself now? Uh, she is an, an African girl, Dinka girl. Uh, she is right now when she came back, she's she's uh, started wearing a South Sudanese flag <laughs> and uh, start uh, listening to South Sudanese music and uh, searching. Uh, sort of googling up or searching, searching up, uh, you know, uh, well-known South Sudanese people. Uh, now uh, she came back a little bit, learned, you know, believe me or not, only twelve days, she can understand Dinka a little bit better than before. So, which means she put an effort to learn that. Now uh, she said, "Uncle so, Uncle so, Uncle so," and I like that part anti so and anti so and so and so so a god came back a little bit you know uh, change and she said you know baba you know that's how we call they call us uh that uh, now she appreciate what what we have here in the u.s <laughs> that was that was really i said wow okay she said now i appreciate uh what we have now i, I you know in, in the u.s so beside that, she's sort of uh, being proud of, of meeting uh, grandma and, and many grammars and many uncles and aunties and cousins and so on. So I got came back very, uh, you know, you know, you know, you, you know uh, happy. Uh, she, she said, now I'm going back to school happy. So uh, John, a general question, uh, I would enjoy hearing more about your accomplishments. So I guess that is uh, in, in part your work in gatherings of Sudanese in the United States, uh, in part the work of your foundation that uh, Trina uh, alluded to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, wh where in particular um, are you uh, bringing uh, food and clothing or medical care to displaced people, educational resources? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I love the story that your 
first application for a grant was when you were in Kakuma camp in which a missionary from Virginia uh, named Mark Nickel uh, taught you how to apply for money for books. That's correct. Um, so, uh, Mark, as I share with you, Mark Nickel, uh, late Mark Nickel, who died, uh, was a wonderful, um, uh, you know, you know, missionary there came there and and help us there. But when I came to United States, I um, I, I see uh, uh, you know, country with abundance, country with people that are ready to help, uh, and they start helping me and others as well. So I thought it would be a good idea also to give to others. You're being helped, you help other people. So I start. I end up forming about six nonprofit organizations, starting with Lost Boy Foundation of New York. Uh, my second was American Care for Sudan Foundation. I became also director of Direct Change, uh, the John Duff Foundation, South Sudan Nation Builders, and then South Sudan I uh, Initiative. Those six nonprofit organizations, now I'm running two, I'm running American, uh, you know, South Sudan Nation Builders and John Duff Foundation. I have raised a total of about $6 million uh, to, uh, since 2004 uh, to now. I have built uh, 14 facilities right now, uh, you know, that been helping people. I, we have saved about 1.7 million people. Those went through these facilities, uh, getting medical care, all those, all those type of medical care, either mother giving birth, prenatal, post prenatal and postnatal care, uh, treating of malaria, treating of typhoid, dysentery, things like uh, guinea worm, uh, others, all these kind of diseases that you would think. That's what we do there. Also, we are helping children and mothers who are malnourished, have no enough food in the United States. People don't like many calories in South Sudan right now because of war and because of flood. People need more calories, you know? So we, we bring them food. So we, John Duff Foundation and South Sudan Nation Builders, we are working with UNICEF, we're working with World Food Program, we're working with Catholic charities, and, and, and then USAID, and so on. These are uh, funders that have been funding my work there in South Sudan. As, as we speak, I have about 161 employees now. I raise money here in the United States. Uh, uh, to support these uh, very important work, you know, getting ambulance, getting boats. You know, we have some facilities along the River Nile as well. Uh, these are a hard place to go. We, 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 ha we have some boats that go there, bring food, bring medicine, and so on. This is the work that I'm doing, and I thought this is the work the Lord Almighty God selected me to do, and I'm going to do. I'm going to uh, deliver what the Lord have asked me to do. And that's what I uh, will continue to do. And this is because of inspired by a Episcopalian uh, missionary, uh, Mark Nickel, who uh, helped me because I went to him and I said, look, we have guys here, girls here who have nowhere to read. They are going to sit for a national examination in Kenya, but they don't have books to read, to study and I need help. And Mark Nicole, okay, so you say, what do you want? I said, I would like to have a library. And he said, okay, go and write your proposal. I wrote a proposal uh, totaling to about $1,000 uh, or 800, I think $1,000. And he said, okay, John, can you go to other churches? Because there were seven churches in the camp, go to other churches so they can write in the similar proposal as well. We did the same thing, all of us, and then I guess he came back to Virginia. He got, I guess, $7,000, gave it to us. Uh, we built it, not only just built it, but we bought, uh, I mean, I mean built these libraries in seven places, seven churches, but also bought books. These, these libraries, I right know as we speak, they're still there in refugee camp now. I was inspired by that uh, missionary that I can do, you know, there's nothing impossible, you know? And so anything that I do right now, Nothing impossible. I can try things and keep trying. If I fail, keep, get, get up, move on. That's not the end of everything. I'm just gonna try and fail and try. Maybe I'm going to be successful. 
And that's what I'm doing right now, running all the, the John Duff Foundation and, and uh, South Sudan nation builders in the US here, very important. I also brought some South Sudanese uh, two, you know, uh, two boys here. They came here through my scholarship, <laughs> you know. They, they just finished, one finished uh, medical technology. He wanted to be a doctor. And another one is actually still uh, studying now. He wanted to become a, uh, uh, an accountant. And so, and I said, so this is what is important. Once you get that, turn around, help other people. You know, you just, you know, I give it to you, give it to other person, you know? And that's what we're doing. I think Trina knows, Trina helped me. We went to uh, VCU. <laughs> you know, looking for a scholarship there. So Trina and I, and Trina, she said very well that we connected, we bond very well because of how we were brought up, you know, really, <laughs> that, that's what it is. And so, and, and that happened meaning of it. When Trina was asking me, being brought up in a community like that and some, how did that help you? And of course, this is how it helped me. And all of the things that we've been doing uh, together with uh, Trina, been helping me so much on these. It's very important. Got to help to help other people. Once you become strong, God did not give you power, a strength, just only for yourself. Give it to other people as well. Cheer. That's John. Thank you. That may be a, a good point to uh, stop. Both summarizing your work and a reminder for me about trying things that don't always work. So I'm going to try once again to post the PowerPoint with the uh, connections um, and see if I have any more uh, success than I did before. Um, and it's going to take me a second here to see if I can get this to cooperate. Now, can anybody uh, see this or is this somehow Captured. Oh, you can actually see it. So what I've put up here are three links, uh, one to the John Dow Foundation, in which you can hear, you can read about ongoing projects, and there's also information uh, about those who would like to contribute to that work. There is a, a link to the documentary, the movie that John mentioned, uh, God Grew Tired of Us with uh, you get to see John and you get to hear Nicole Kidman uh, and you get to see that um, Brad Pitt was one of the producers of this uh, production. Um, and then the National Geographic films um, created a uh, educational link that would allow uh, those who uh, want to look at the material and use it as a basis of discussion. So we're going to leave this up uh for the next uh four or five minutes uh if so that anyone would like to uh copy that can uh, find that information and uh, i also uh, want to thank you very much for uh joining us all uh who were here uh today and remind you that our next virtual presentation will be on sunday september 18th at 4 p.m and our speaker will be brad parks who uh is a resident of Middlesex County and I think uh, also spent some time in Williamsburg. He is a well known uh, mystery writer, author of 11 mysteries, and uh, translated into many languages. And at one point, got the, uh, it was the number one bestseller of mysteries on Amazon Books. So he is, uh, it will be fascinating. Um, one of the details he's mentioned in interviews is. He likes to sit in Hardy's uh, and work on his novels. Uh, so I don't know whether anybody who's been to the Hardy's and Saluda will uh, recognize characters in his books. I haven't quite seen how that shows up, but that will be a wonderful conversation. So, I, Trina, something correcting? Yeah, I just put in the chat because I think actually, Bob, you're on the opening slide. If you, I don't know if you can click on slide two, but I dropped in the chat some of the links that you mentioned. Um, I also put my email address at Collegiate there. Um, if you would like to to um, learn more with John or talk to John, that John and I always um, are open to connecting and um, sharing his story. John loves to talk to all kinds of audiences. Um, John, I don't know if you want to add to that, but my email is in the chat. Absolutely, the John Dow. It's the John Dow 
foundation.com. Uh, if you want to go to our website, it's John, J O H N, Dow, D A U, and foundation.com. With no spaces. Yeah. <laughs> that one underlines. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so, yes, I, uh, an example of failure, I'm looking on my screen on the second slide, uh, but um, somehow that has not reached anybody else. Interesting. And uh, Trina, this is back to your message of presentation mode, but I don't um, see that as a, an option anywhere on my screen, but you. That's okay. I put some links in the chat. Um, we have that in the. Yep. And you know how to reach John and I as well. Yes. Well, uh, thank you all. Uh, and I believe uh, we, we will also make sure that our website uh, for the Middlesex County Museum has those links as well. Thank you all very much uh, for spending uh, Sunday afternoon uh, with us. Um, I very much appreciate your, um, your participation. Thank you all. God bless you. Thank you. Chris Rob, now we're seeing the second screen. Oh, now it comes up. <laughs> now you know how to. So I don't, I was just uh, trying to close out, but it's now visible. No. Well, we're seeing the second screen, but it's still not in slideshow mode. It's your whole, it's oh, we're seeing that. your whole screen, but it's all good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Sure. Uh, thank you. John and, and Vasida, thank you for. Uh, your uh, your perpetual skill in in uh, things that I don't seem to be able to quite figure out. <laughs> well, and I need to get John down to the river. We've talked about it so many times, but we just are running in a hundred directions, and he has all those five beautiful children, and he he and Martha are so busy. But um, it's one of my goals is to bring him to Christ Church and and to come spend the day. So we'll have to make sure you guys know when he comes. Do a tour of Middlesex County. That's right. I know he he's 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 had to drop off. He just texted me, but um, he's just wonderful and he's so intelligent and his children are just so smart. Um, just really really amazing family. So I've loved to getting to know them. Okay, uh, let's see. So who needs to sign us out? I've got to stop. Oh, you can just um, you, yeah. yeah. You just can just sit, leave. I, yeah, I'll end the meeting and so we can go. Oh, yeah. All right. Thank you, Thank Ms. Leda. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, thank, thank, thank you, Michael, for hanging with us, of course, as always. Okay, have a great day. <laughs>